Hi, it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining us again today for our Facebook Live Chats as part of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You know, obviously we talked about breast reconstruction this morning with some of our plastic surgeons, and now we're back. We're very excited to be here talking with Dr. Deborah Farr about breast cancer surgery options. So before we get started, a couple different things. You know, I wanna thank the Moncrief Cancer Institute, of course, they've been tremendously helpful in helping us promote these chats and talk and share them. You know, in terms of sharing, don't forget, you know, this conversation is gonna be about 30 minutes. So please like the conversation, love it, share it with your friends. We wanna get as many questions and comments in as we can. You know, for comments, make sure you're leaving them in the comments section of your Facebook feed. And we will take as many of them as we can get to. So if you start having audio issues at any time, you know, please just refresh your browser. That tends to work for most people. So to get started, you know, I want to welcome Dr. Deborah Farr to sit down and talk with us for a while. You know, I'm glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I know we've got a lot to cover in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked a little bit about breast cancer surgery. You know, who is who would be a candidate for surgery? So basically, breast surgery, um, depending on the type of surgery that we do, um, is a pretty well-tolerated surgery. So mm -hmm. unless there are severe um, comorbid conditions like severe heart conditions okay. or things mm -hmm. where um, anesthesia is very difficult to obtain, then most people can tolerate breast surgery. Okay. All right. So there are obviously lots of different types of surgeries out mm -hmm. there. What are, what are some of the common ones that you perform here at UG Southwestern? Well, um, starting from benign to the more um, advanced or aggressive surgeries, um, if someone has a mammogram and mm -hmm. they have a, a, a biopsy of something that is benign but we're, we're not really sure what it is okay. and we'd like to take more tissue, we do something called an excisional biopsy, mm -hmm. which is just a, a little bit um, of, I make an incision and just take a little bit more tissue than okay. the biopsy that's done in radiology. Um, if there is a cancer found, then there are two options, really. There is um, what we do, or what we call a lumpectomy or a partial mm -hmm. mastectomy. Those mm -hmm. two things are the same thing. Okay. That is accompanied by radiation afterwards, about a month after surgery. Okay. The other option is a mastectomy, and there are lots of different types of mastectomies. Right. Um, and that is basically dependent on the size of the breast, what their cosmetic goals are afterwards. Okay. Um, and what kind of reconstruction they're interested in. Okay. All right. So we've got a couple questions that are already coming in, so sure. we're going to take the first one. Mm -hmm. And the first question is, is family history, mm -hmm. which is lost here for a second, the only factor that determines when someone should start getting mammograms? No. Um, if someone has had, uh, well, family history is important. Um, if someone has had a previous uh, imaging study that has shown something that has been concerning or high risk, mm -hmm. um, then they can start screening earlier. Okay. Um, if they have things that expose them to higher risk, like um, basically anything that exposes their exposure to estrogen. Okay. So if they have um, a high estrogen exposure risk, then mm -hmm. they should definitely do screening. I think right now, um, Back in 2015, the guidelines changed as to mm -hmm. when mammograms should be started. We used to say that it starts at 40. Mm -hmm. um, now people are saying at the age of 45. Um, a little bit longer. Right. However, if there are, um, are if there are factors that makes a woman high risk, like increased family history, a previous mm -hmm. biopsy that puts you at higher risk, higher estrogen exposure, those types of things, okay. um, or uh, exposure to radiation or mm -hmm. other types of cancer treatments, then we would start screening sooner. Okay, it's good to know. Very good question there. So we've got another one from mm -hmm. Cindy. So Cindy says, hi, Dr. Farr. Hi. When a patient has a genetic mutation increasing their risk of developing breast cancer, yeah. what do you recommend as preventative? bilateral mastectomy or something else? So there are choices when you have a genetic mutation. You don't necessarily have to go to a bilateral mastectomy, though that is an option. Um, we can do what's called high-risk screening, and that basically entails having a mammogram alternating with an MRI every six months. So okay. basically you have an MRI every year, and then six months later um, you have a, a mammogram every year. So you okay. get screened every six months. Um, there is a drug called tamoxifen, which basically mm -hmm. blocks the estrogen receptor in your body, which can decrease um, your risk of having a cancer. Okay. Depending on the genetic mutation, the efficacy of tamoxifen is different. So talk to your breast cancer provider, your surgeon, your medical oncologist, and see what option is best for you. Okay, really great, great question, Cindy. Thanks for submitting it. We hope you submit some more. We do, um, what about this one? 
how long is the recovery process after breast cancer surgery? I assume that varies yeah. by person. Right. So if you have a lumpectomy, then usually the recovery is, you know, it's an outpatient surgery. Mm -hmm. um, usually a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy is accompanied by a sentinel node biopsy. So usually okay. the patient has two incisions, one on their breast and then one in their armpit, their axilla area. Okay. Usually that can be a little bit uncomfortable, but people mm -hmm. go home that day. Um, they take pain pills. Um, you know, usually they take them to sleep, but usually it's pretty well tolerated. Mm -hmm. For a mastectomy, people stay overnight, um, okay. and they either stay one night or sometimes if they're after chemotherapy, sometimes they stay two nights. Okay. Um, they the pain control is a little bit different depending on the type of reconstruction you have. A lot of times, if you don't have reconstruction, it's not as painful. Okay. So people have better pain control, um, but usually people are on pain pills for about. Um, 10 days or until mm -hmm. about those drains are out mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that you're bedridden or that you're not able to do things you can right. go out to dinner you can you know go around your house you can you know visit with people it's not something that's debilitating or mm -hmm. is going to prevent you from doing daily activities that you normally enjoy okay so you mentioned reconstructive and obviously that's something we talked about this morning yeah I mean what is the usual time frame between you know they somebody sees you mm -hmm. and they undergo breast cancer surgery and then they start the reconstructive process so if they have a mastectomy then the the breast tissue after the breast tissue is removed then usually the um, the plastic surgeon puts in uh, an expander or basically a place uh -huh. saver okay. in that space to basically conserve the area that they will eventually fill with an implant or mm -hmm. with tissue. Okay. Um, and that happens at the same time that the breast is removed, that expander is put in. Okay. Afterwards, um, depending on if there's additional therapy needed, for example, if radiation is needed after a mm -hmm. mastectomy, then usually mm -hmm. the reconstructive process is delayed until mm -hmm. the person is recovered from radiation. Okay. Um, if that's not needed, then usually it's it's about a month or two afterwards when they start. Um, the, you know, the different procedures are done to either expand that space if the patient desires a, a larger breast. Mm -hmm. um, or if they would like a tissue transfer, basically, I know that you talked about this this morning, right. um, then they can plan to do the, the tissue transfer surgery shortly after the, they've basically been cleared by us, the oncologists, okay. that it's safe to proceed. Okay. So one of the questions, and that it's kind of related to that, you know, you've talked about a bunch of different options people have. Mm -hmm. How do women, or men in many cases, how do you choose which is the best treatment for them? And that was a question that came in from Crystal. Yeah, it's a really personal decision. Um, what I really try to tease out with patients is what are your goals of care? Okay. And and not only necessarily what their goals of care are, but sometimes, you know, what are you most afraid of? If it's um, if the cosmetic outcome is the thing that's most important to you, then we really mm -hmm. need to tease out what exactly um, your goals are in terms of how you would look afterwards. Okay. Um, some people are very concerned about the length of surgery and what kind of pain they would be in afterwards. We need to figure right. out, you know, what they would be able to tolerate from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't realize that uh, when we do a mastectomy, um, even if it's a nipple sparing mastectomy, the patient will not have nipple sensation afterwards. And so it's very right. important to understand. So if that's something that's important to the woman, then a lumpectomy okay. or partial mastectomy might be a better choice. Okay, that's good. To so one of the questions that came in, and actually if they're saying it's not really a question, she mm -hmm. says, I think I would be really scared if I had to get breast cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? Yeah, this is never anything that someone wants. This is just something that's mm -hmm. sort of placed in their lap. It's not anything that they really have control over. So um, a lot of times it's coming to accept, you know, that they have this mm -hmm. diagnosis in the first place mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out how they can take control back, you know, okay. with all these choices. Because they do have choices in how they are treated, you know, what surgery they would like to have and you know totally. who their surgeon is how they want to be treated where they're going to get their treatment and i think mm -hmm. that that helps empower them to take a little bit of control of the situation that they've never wanted in the first place mm -hmm. right that's a really good question thank you for bringing that up so you know what are what are the the risks associated with surgery obviously anytime you go mm -hmm. into surgery that something can right happen. yeah so i think the the main risks that we quote for surgery are bleeding and infection there's mm -hmm. the risk of anesthesia there's always a risk that you would need more surgery in other words if we found that we didn't take all of the tissue out that we needed to mm -hmm. um there's a risk of cosmetic deformity um there is a risk that um that afterwards they meet may, may not necessarily need more surgery but they may need more treatment that we didn't anticipate for example okay. we could go into surgery saying well we believe that you are stage one um, but then after surgery we say well actually you you were stage two or three and you would actually benefit from chemotherapy or radiation so okay 
there are no I what I like to say is you know we can plan as much as we can and mm -hmm. a lot of times we're very accurate in, in the workup that we do but mm -hmm. there are no guarantees and so sometimes okay. we do find things at the time of surgery that brings up a good question that had come through. They were wondering, you know, when you go in and you complete a breast cancer surgery, mm -hmm. do you get all of the cancer? Yes, that is, yes. well, that is our <laughs> is goal. Is that the goal? Yeah, that's our goal. Um, when we're doing a mastectomy, um, mm -hmm. we remove all of the breast tissue um, in, in that breast. If they're having bilateral mastectomies, then we remove both the breasts and all that breast tissue. Um, if we're doing a partial mastectomy, then we take out the area that has cancer and then mm -hmm. a normal rim of tissue around it called, um, we call it a negative margin. If we're okay. able to get that rim of negative tissue around the tumor, then we have a negative margin. If we're not able to achieve that, then we need to go back in and take more tissue to make sure that we have that negative margin to basically be assured that we have all the tissue that has cancer in it. And okay. We've removed it. Okay. And so does everybody, does everybody who undergoes breast cancer surgery, do they all undergo also radiation therapy? No, the indications for radiation are basically if you leave breast tissue behind or if you're doing a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy, mm -hmm. then you need to radiate that breast afterwards. So lumpectomy and radiation always go together. Mm -hmm. That is equal in terms of survival to a mastectomy. So that's why most people get both choices. Okay. Um, another indication for radiation would be if the lymph nodes are positive. Mm -hmm. um, another reason why you would have radiation after a mastectomy per se, because most of the time you can avoid it unless mm -hmm. you have positive nodes, um, would be if the cancer invades the skin or the muscle or is very okay. large, greater than five centimeters. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a good question. So you have you have some comments here from Jill. Okay. I don't know if you remember Jill, but she mm -hmm. says, kudos to Dr. Farr. She helped me through my first excisional biopsy this year. She explained everything clearly and was attentive to my questions and concerns. The condition was FEA, but the outcome was thankfully benign. Dr. Farr is awesome. Oh, Thank good. you so much for your patience. Glad it was benign. That's a, that's a very nice comment, Jill. Thank you for, Thanks, Jill. for sharing that. We've got another one that came in from Sierra, and this was mm -hmm. something that, that I was curious about. You know, How does breast cancer surgery affect pregnancy and breastfeeding? Oh, awesome question. Yeah. Um, so, Anytime that you do any sort of manipulation to the breast, it can affect breastfeeding. Breastfeeding mm -hmm. is difficult enough as it is, kudos to all the women who do it and mm -hmm. for, you know, are able to do it successfully. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so usually we say that if you have a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy with radiation, a lot of women do succeed and actually mm -hmm. are, in the, are able to breastfeed afterwards. We say that it may be more difficult or we may, you may not be successful. Mm -hmm. Um, if we remove all of that breast tissue, even if you do have a nipple sparing mastectomy, you should not be able to breastfeed because in theory you will not have any breast tissue to, right, to yeah. make milk. Yeah. Okay. That's a really good question. So we've got one from Jacob, and these are all great questions. Everybody, thanks. Keep sending them in. We've got about 15 minutes left. So from Jacob, he mm -hmm. says, do all patients who have a partial mastectomy need radiation therapy post-operatively? Almost all, and that's the thing that's tricky about mm -hmm. um, breast cancer and breast surgery is that there's always an exception. Um, so there have been studies that demonstrate that women who are older and who are lower risk okay. may not benefit from radiation, and that's something that our radiation oncology colleagues discuss mm -hmm. with the patients. But the vast majority of women who have a cancer and have a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy need radiation afterwards. Okay, all right, really good question, Jacob. Thanks for submitting it. So. I was wondering, you know, and since it's our first meeting to ask a question, yeah. you obviously treat male breast cancer patients mm -hmm. as well. I mean, how does your treatment differ for males versus women, or is there a difference? I think that there is a difference in the way that um, I approach a male patient versus mm -hmm. a female patient. Um, the, the male patient, I think, is less interested in the reconstruction options, mm -hmm. although they are available, um, mm -hmm. you know, if the, if the man chooses to do that. I think that most men, if they are going to have surgery, they would like a mastectomy rather than just having a partial mastectomy or just taking out part of the tissue. Mm -hmm. But in general, the treatment from an oncologic perspective mm -hmm. or from a cancer treatment perspective is the same. And actually, okay. men do the same in terms of survival. Mm -hmm. um, stage for stage as women do. Okay. So it's very similar. There you go. So mm -hmm. we've got lots of questions coming in. Mm -hmm. This one, she says, I'm sorry if you already answered this. Mm -hmm. She's been told that cystic breast tissue might become cancerous. Is that true? Uh, well, I think that cystic breast tissue is something that we obviously monitor because it can make it more difficult to see something in the tissue that would be dangerous. 
Um, cystic breast tissue in and of itself doesn't necessarily turn into cancer. It's just something that we note on a mammogram, for example, if women have very cystic breasts, the difficulty is, is that cysts come and go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so a lot of times it can be difficult to monitor from year to year um, what the breast looks like if there are cysts taking up that space. But in and of itself, usually cysts are benign creatures. Mm -hmm. um, if they if they appear suspicious, a lot of times what we'll do is we will um, take a biopsy of the cyst wall. Um, a lot of times we address cysts more for pain because they can, you know, when they Heart. fill up, right, when they fill up that space, they can become painful. Mm -hmm. um, so we aspirate the fluid and a lot of times that provides relief. Okay, really good question. So let's see, we've got one from S Samin. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but Samin, she says, what do you think about a macrobiotic diet and holistic care without chemo and radiation? If someone has cancer? Yes. Um, I think that um, anything, listen, the body is, you know, your heart is connected to your head and connected to your body. All these things work together and I really believe that if something um, makes you feel better and mm -hmm. you know, gives you faith in the way that you're treating yourself, um, I think that that's very valuable. From a completely data-driven standpoint, um, there are not data that support that just that therapy would provide a cure that we traditionally understand. Mm -hmm. But a lot of okay. times what I say, especially to women who are perhaps not candidates for surgery, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I don't want to put them through a treatment that is going to be worse than the disease. Right, so. okay. So there you go, really good question, thanks for asking. So we've got one from Lori. And again, these are great questions, <laughs> ladies, keep them coming. Is there a chance, so after surgery, is there a chance that the cancer will spread and what can be done to prevent that? So that's a great question. So as I tell everybody, you know, we do the best that we can, but of course there are no guarantees in life. The cancer could always spread, of course. Even, um, even when we do surgery, when we do bilateral mastectomies, um, there still is a very low chance, like a two to five percent chance that a breast cancer could occur in the breast. Again, mm -hmm. even though in theory you do not have any breast tissue. What we do is, um, breast cancer is a, it's a team sport, it's a multi-modality um, uh, discipline, basically. Mm -hmm. We treat it with surgery, with chemotherapy, and with radiation. The way that I describe it to my patients is, think of your cancer as kind of like an anthill, right? So okay. there are lots of different ways to get rid of an anthill. One mm -hmm. is to dig it up, right? And so that would be the surgery, but there could be some ants, some stray creatures around that may get creative and create the anthill again, right? right. Um, if you use radiation, that would be kind of like a garden hose, like you get rid of all the ants, you know, in that right. area. But again, there may be some that have survived hunkered down somewhere that mm -hmm. could recreate that. Um, and then of course, even if you dig it up and you, you know, use your garden hose all over the place, there's still may, may be ants from outside that may come in and recreate that. Right. Um, chemotherapy is kind of like a smoke bomb or something to basically mm -hmm. treat your whole body. So if there are stray cells somewhere right. in your body, then it would kill those. So that's why it's a multi-modality therapy. And then there is what we call endocrine therapy, which is a therapy mm -hmm. that people take for several years, usually about five to 10 years after their cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's for estrogen or progesterone positive cancer. It basically gotcha. blocks that receptor to prevent a growth of another cancer. Okay, really good question. So um, related to that, you were talking about um, a bunch of different things, different types of therapies. We've heard a little bit about and I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sure, but mm -hmm. adjuvant therapy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how does that fit, fit into this? So um, those are the different types of therapies and when they occur. So basically mm -hmm. um, everything um, is... It, timing is everything, you know, they say that. Oh, of course. So there are patients who benefit from chemotherapy before surgery, and that's mm -hmm. called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. If chemotherapy um, or a treatment is given after surgery, then it's called adjuvant therapy. Okay. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy would be indicated for, I usually, I quiz the residents on this all the time. Um, and basically, it, neoadjuvant chemotherapy would be um, pertinent for women who have a triple negative breast cancer, which okay. means that they're negative for the estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 new receptor. Mm -hmm. If they have the HER2 new receptor, um, then before surgery, they get um, a chemotherapy that has two drugs as opposed to after surgery, they would only get one of the, these drugs. Okay. Um, if they have an inflammatory cancer, um, then they would get chemotherapy first. Um, if they have a very large cancer um, that uh, would in theory if the patient would like to have breast conservation or a lumpectomy mm -hmm. rather than a mastectomy mm -hmm. um, to shrink that cancer, we give the chemotherapy first. 
And the third is, or I'm sorry, and the fifth it would be if they had um, lymph node positive disease. And the reason why we give the chemotherapy first is that hopefully the chemotherapy will treat that lymph node so that we wouldn't have to take out more of those lymph nodes underneath the arm. Okay. And the benefit to that is that then they would hopefully be able to avoid the complication called lymphedema or arm swelling okay. after surgery. Yeah, that was actually one of the questions that came in earlier was they were wondering, you know, what are the risks of developing lymphedema? Yeah, so lymphedema is basically associated with um, any sort of manipulation in the axilla. Mm -hmm. So um, a sentinel lymph node biopsy carries a, about a 5 to 8% risk of having lymphedema. Okay. Um, if you have an axillary dissection, which is where you take out the bottom two-thirds of lymph nodes in the armpit, mm -hmm. that carries about a 25% percent risk of having lymphedema. If then that is augmented with adjuvant radiation or radiation afterwards mm -hmm. because lymph nodes are positive, then your risk of lymphedema goes up to about 50%. Oh, wow. Um, we're doing a clinical trial right now, which um, is studying if you really need to do that surgery or mm -hmm. if we can just do radiation to the axilla. Mm -hmm. Radiation alone to the axilla only has about an 11% risk of lymphedema. Wow. So it's a great study to it do because lower. if we can save, um, yeah, if we can save women from getting lymphedema, that would be wonderful because it's a very difficult thing to treat. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's a chronic progressive thing that's, that's difficult to reverse. Right. So you mentioned clinical trials. Yeah. How can people, are there clinical trials that people can get, get involved with here that don't have breast cancer? Um, most of our clinical trials are, are involved with, with women who Patients. do have breast cancer. And okay. when a patient is um, a candidate for one, we're very anxious to approach them with if they would like to participate or not. Right. Um, because enrollment in these not only helps them, but it also helps us study mm -hmm. the disease and helps move the, the discipline forward. So yeah, we're, we're very proactive about getting our women involved. So then it sounds like that if somebody is a, if somebody's a patient here, mm -hmm. then all any clinical trials that are available will be offered yeah, to them. Yeah, we try to offer it to them, yes, okay. for sure. Okay. So we've got another question that came in, mm -hmm. and she says, if I undergo radiation, will I lose my hair? And how long after radiation does that happen? Great question. Um, no, you won't. Um, so basically radiation happens about- you just made her really happy. <laughs> <laughs> radiation happens about a month after surgery. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make you sick. It doesn't make you lose your hair. Um, basically it is, um, you go in, every day Monday through Friday for about five minutes a day and it mm -hmm. lasts from about for about five to six weeks mm -hmm. and you basically sit in a chair they push a button you get up and you go home a lot of times they don't even turn off your car you like you drive in you go in wow. you sit down you go home I spend more time at Starbucks I tell my patients so it's, it's very quick um, I think the worst part about it is that you know it's annoying because you have to go in every day right. but you make friends they give you chocolate um, you get like a little bit of a sunburn and sometimes you can get fatigued okay. afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the type of surgery that you've had, for example, if you've had a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy, usually mm -hmm. radiation is pretty well tolerated. Sometimes um, that sunburn and that contracture of the skin can be difficult if you have an expander in place. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the skin can get a little bit tight. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. our plastic surgeons are really good about you know deflating the expander if they need to and taking care of that skin. So okay. that's usually pretty well tolerated. All right, so we've got, it looks like we have five more minutes for questions, so keep them coming. We've got one that just came in from Paige. Mm -hmm. This is similar to what we were talking about earlier. She says, how do you help your patients cope with their diagnosis and deal with the reality that they need surgery? Mm -hmm. Do you have community groups on campus, places you refer them to? Do you have groups within maybe the cancer center here? Yeah, we do. We have, um, we have a survivorship group and we have a great set of volunteers in our breast center. The volunteers are actually breast cancer survivors themselves. Oh wow. And I think that that's one of the best things about the cancer center is a mm -hmm. lot of times, um, you know, myself, even though I treat this every day, um, I've never been through it. And so the creature comforts of, you know, what is it like to have drains in or, you know, mm. what is it like not being able to sleep on my stomach or what is it like losing my hair, those types of things. Right. Um, we have survivors that basically have been through all those things. Um, really amazing women who are able to share their stories. Yeah. Um, like I have one woman who was able to use, they ha we have to have these things called cold caps mm -hmm. um, that uh, if you use them during chemotherapy can help you keep your hair. And I have one woman who was just really amazing at it. And she always threw me off because she came in with this full head of beautiful hair and I said wait you had chemotherapy she's like I know I did the cold caps and so she's wow. able to tell her story to other women who are hopefully able to replicate the same thing that she did our volunteers also like make these little pillows that they can put underneath their arms right, for, um, for when they have the drains in so that they can hopefully sleep on their sides oh. and they can talk to them about you know what is it exactly that you're most scared about is it mm -hmm. losing your hair is it being in pain is it not having breasts is it not mm -hmm. having sensation in your breasts right. is it about you know the 
what you don't know what you're going to look like afterwards. I need to sort of tease that out, and the volunteers really help me do that. Wow, that sounds like an amazing program. Yeah, so yeah, they're wonderful. Here. Thank you for asking that question. You know, I think one of the things that you've touched on a little bit is that it sounds like it's really a team approach. It really here. is. It's a team. Does sport. that differ among places you would go for cancer treatment, or is that really unique to UG Southwestern? Well, seeing as how this is my first job as faculty, um, I would say that um, I don't. I, I probably don't have enough experience to comment on that, um, but I think that most places try to have a multidisciplinary, that's the gold mm -hmm. standard, is to mm -hmm. have a multidisciplinary um, setting where all people are involved and participate in the different types mm -hmm. of care. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when you can really communicate amongst providers, I think that right. that's like the best situation. You know, people always think about having the best doctor who's like trained the best. Mm -hmm. I think that that's awesome, but I think that the way to get even better care is when all of those doctors communicate so that they're all, it's not like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Like everybody right. has the same goals of care. Right. You know, when I, we have a radiation oncologist, Ann Spangler, who comes mm -hmm. to our clinic and I say, do you think that you'd be able to do radiation on this lady? How do you think that that would be affected? And if right. she says, no, I, I won't be able to, then I will talk to them. You know, maybe a mastectomy is a better choice for you. Gotcha. So it's really important to know how the disciplines work. We, we communicate with our medical oncologists all the time about, you know, do you think that this person should have chemotherapy before surgery, or do you think right. that it would be better after surgery? So it's really important to really coordinate to see, like, you know, what everybody's opinions are. To that end, we also do a conference every Tuesday where we discuss challenging patients and see what everybody's consensus opinion is on challenging cases that you know may fall outside of traditional guidelines. Gotcha. That sounds really. That sounds great. Yeah. So we've got two more questions in here. One of them yeah. is from Sarah. And this is an interesting one. She says, knowing that UT Southwestern is a teaching facility, mm -hmm. can college pre-med students find ways to shadow or better, better understand breast cancer? I don't know, do you have any sort of a program where somebody could come follow you around for a day? Is that even an option? So we've had medical students come in and shadow. I think okay. that um, they aren't allowed to participate with us right. in the OR, and I think you do have to have... <coughs> Excuse um, me you know, special clearance because we, right. we do try and protect our patients and our, right. you know, patient confidentiality. So you have to go through, um, actually, I don't even know what you have to go through. Um, but it, it is very, you, you do have to have um, right. a special criteria to be able to observe in a patient setting. That being said, we do have a lot of students, medical students, nursing mm -hmm. students, who rotate through our clinics. Um, and it's invaluable the questions that they ask as well as I feel like their sure. experience with us because some things that you know we forget that we know mm -hmm. when they ask, of it's course. good to revisit that and yeah. also make sure that we tell patients things that you know may be second nature to, right. to the way that we treat people. So as an add on to that, so Sarah, we do have a volunteer program here through Clements University Hospital. And if you go online to the patient care website, which is UT swmedicine.org, you, you can find out some information about how to apply for that program. And I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, but hopefully that'll help. And mm -hmm. um, we did have another question here from Jill. Mm -hmm. And so Jill asks, will there ever be a new way to conduct needle biopsies? Oh yeah, they're not the, they're not the most fun thing they're to go with there. Comfortable. <laughs> yeah. So I think that, um, uh, will there ever, I'm sure, you know, never say never. Um, they've been, um, wonderful in advancing the field so so far as it as it is now where you know they used to in the 70s mm -hmm. they used to or actually even before that um, if you had a lump in your breast you would go to the operating room and you'd go to sleep and then if you right. woke up and it was hours later then not only did you have breast cancer but you didn't have a breast now we we're able to biopsy it before wow. you go to the operating room or even have anything done so that we can you know treat you appropriately Hopefully, they can become a little bit more comfortable, um, and I know they're trying to, to improve that every day. Um, I think that a lot of times, if you can be in a more comfortable position, then it's not as taxing, right. and if you, they explain you know, what you're going through before you go through it, mm -hmm. a lot of times it's, it's better when you sort of um, aren't knowing what you don't know or what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. You have a little bit more knowledge. Yeah. All right, we've got one minute, so I'm gonna take this last question. This one is from Tamara. She says, do you recommend tamoxifen for patients who've been diagnosed with ER negative BC? Um, usually we do not recommend tamoxifen if your estrogen receptor is negative. Mm -hmm. We do, however, if you have a progesterone receptor that is positive. Um, sometimes cancers can be mosaic or basically some of it expresses the estrogen receptor and some of it mm -hmm. doesn't. So if okay. you would glean any sort of benefit from taking the tamoxifen, we usually ask that you take it. Okay. All right, really great question. So that is, I think we're 
all out of time and just making sure we got all of our questions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're gonna wrap it up for the day. We wanna thank everybody for tuning in, for asking Dr. Farr all the wonderful questions. Thanks again to Moncrief Cancer Institute for supporting. And don't forget, this time next week, noon on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking to Dr. Theodora Rost about breast cancer genetics, so tune in then. In the meantime, I wanna thank Dr. Farr for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely.